Welcome uh, to church today on the very first Sunday of, uh, of the year. We'd like to welcome you, and we're also going to be celebrating communion at the end of the service. Would you please stand as we sing, All Glory Be to Christ.
please be seated. We just have a few announcements this morning. Um, I'd like to take this time to remind you that we have Bible study that meets here uh, down in the Fellowship Hall on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. Um, you can either join um, in person or also online. We do that. And if you need a Zoom link, if you want to call the, the office, we'd be happy to provide that for you. Um, we are going to, we're looking forward to continuing that through the year. We've been working through a study, Emotionally Healthy Relationships, and it's been just a really growing time for all of us, both, both personally and as a church. Um, we also want to remind you, we have an Amazon playlist that um, we put together just so you can hear the music that we do on Sunday morning. Some of us, some of us listen to contemporary uh, music on the radio and, and others not so much. So this gives you an opportunity to hear some of the songs that we've been introducing, some songs that um, we really enjoy by some current Christian um, artists. And so that's an opportunity to do that. And also one more thing, we have coming up on January 21st, a new member potluck following the service. And so we'll have a sign-up available soon that you can sign up if you'd like to bring something or if, you're, uh, if you'd just like to come and celebrate with us those new members here at, um, at Bethel from 2023. Um, with that, would you please stand and we'll continue on with our worship and the reading of God's Word. Our scripture today comes from John 8, 31 and 32. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Please pray with me. Father God, we stand here at the beginning of the year and uh, we ask, Lord, that you would be in our plans, Lord. We, uh, we may make plans in our heart of what we want to do this year, Lord, but we ask that, um, well, Lord, we, we earnestly seek what you would have us do, Lord, in and out of uh, our, our daily lives, Lord, through the week. We thank you and uh, praise you for all that you are doing within our lives and our families and within our church. And I ask that, um, I pray, Lord, that this service would be pleasing to you, Lord. 
We thank you for all the things that you have given us. And uh, we thank you. Amen. at this time that we prayerfully consider what we can give back to the church. And you can do that four ways, um, through our website, through an automatic payment, through your financial institution, uh, by mailing in a check, or here in the service you can give uh, in the offering plate. Um, we are going to sing this morning. Uh, come Christians, join to sing. If you would please sing with us. is going to pray for us.
Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you this morning, Lord, for all the many blessings, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your love, your grace, your mercy, Lord. We thank you for the financial support that we can give back to this church and the work that it does, Lord. And we just ask that you would touch it and, and help it to, to reach the people that it needs to reach, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the many people that, that serve around this church and to help around this church. And, Lord, we just... Thank you for, for all that you do for us. We give it to you in your name this morning. Amen. Amen. Children are going to stay in here today. I know that's good news for all of you. All right. How can we pray for one another this morning? We're praying for Denise. Her brother is in the hospital, and uh, he needs a lot of prayer. They're doing some tests. They're not quite sure uh, what he's been recovering from one ailment, but this is a new ailment, so we want to pray for him. And for those of you that uh, know De Denise, just give her a call and let her know that you're praying. All right? Mom is homesick today. She had planned on coming, but she wasn't feeling well this morning, so I already went over, did a quick cardiac check on her, but please remember her in prayer today. All right. I'm real glad to see Jennifer made it back home safely after she took Pierce up, back up to Michigan Tech. Um, I would like travel mercies for Mandy, Paul, and Hope who are coming home after a visit with her mom and dad in Florida. okay to offer praises. I'm praising God that I'm doing okay and improving after all the, the, uh, the stuff that I went through in December and the time I spent in the hospital. Um, I'm very grateful to be here and preaching, and we had a wonderful time in Florida, um, uh, you know, except for, of course, Pierce brought fish home, which you, I think many of you know how I feel about fish, but Pierce loves fish. So we went up fishing and brought home a big bucket load, a big tank full of a uh, fish that he took up to his buddies up in northern, uh, not northern, up in um, Michigan Tech, and uh, his, he's feeding a big house full of guys with, uh, with the fish he caught. So uh, we're just going to continue to praise God for all that he's been doing through our church and the miracles we've been seeing in our own lives and in our church. This year is going to be a great year, so let us pray and lift up our service to the Lord. Lord, we are just so grateful to be here. We lift up those who are sick and need your healing power those who are mourning and need your comfort. You've heard all of those that we've shared here today, and, and plus there are people online that have prayer requests that they're putting in there now, and, and people who here have prayer requests that they haven't shared here, the secrets in their heart. We ask you to touch all of those, to meet all of those. And Lord, help us to see where you are working. Help us to see the miracles and the way you are blessing this church and blessing our city and, and blessing our lives in spite of all the things that may be going on. And we are so grateful that you are here, that you love us, and that uh, we have a chance to open your word up here today. And we have a chance to, to examine your word deeply and, and be blessed by it. And I pray that as we examine your word here today, we are open to you, that we are blessed by you, and that we are lifted up by your words. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Uh, we are continuing our journey in the book of John, and we are in chapter 8 in the book of John. And uh, today we come to a passage which is very famous for a lot of you. A lot of us have memorized it. Uh, John 8, 31. Uh, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Or some of you may know it as the truth will set you free. That's the old King James. And he, but here it says make you free. It's not, that's not a big difference. There are two key words, though, when we look at this passage that we want to key on, uh, that we want to camp out on this morning. And, and the two words are free and truth. And, and for Jesus and his hearers, those things meant something different than maybe we hear. Um, free. Free. We are a nation of freedom, aren't we? Amen? A nation of freedom. 
But our concept of freedom is not the same as what Jesus is talking about here. Or even as our founding fathers understood what freedom was. We don't have the same idea of freedom. Oxford defines freedom this way for the modern person. The power or right to act, speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. This is the modern concept, that I am able to do whatever I want, anytime I want, at all times. This is, this is the modern idea of what freedom is. Um, now, this is in line with modern philosophers, their view of what freedom is. And Tim Keller points this out, that it's a limited way of thinking. Uh, that is, the way that we experience reality, uh, this definition of freedom is unsatisfying. It doesn't fit in to how we experience reality. No one can live like this. Now, I want to give an example. The example's a bit harsh. I'm just going to warn you a little bit about that because some of us have had this experience, and I've known people have had this experience. So it may make some of you uncomfortable. I apologize for that. But I want, it, I want, I want this example to have an impact, okay? So this is why I'm using it. So I'm in the hospital. This is not me personally, I'm just saying it. I'm. I'm in the hospital and the doctor explains to me that I now have diabetes and that I recently went through a shock to my system and that if I want to live, uh, I have to change my diet, my habits, and my life. Being a good American or a great American, I turn to my doctor and tell him, nobody tells me how to live. Uh, you will not limit my freedom. I will continue to eat Oreos and Twinkies and ice cream. I will not be impeded by your feeble attempt to curb my freedom. <laughs> I've known people who've done that, right? And the doctor has, usually has two words for this person, right? Your funeral, right? We, we have a choice. Often when we, when we encounter freedom, freedom brings, in, in, as we experience reality, there, there's nothing, no one experienced true, ultimate, uh, un, unencumbered freedom. You, you can't. It's not possible under that definition to ever have freedom. Um, the doctor, so uh, the point, our lives are constantly filled with choices. We choose one thing over another, and often we can't choose both. I can have Oreos and ice cream, or I can live, right? For some people, that's the reality. Or bacon and a heart attack, or live. A uh, couch potato and TV, or I'm kind of in a rut here. Let me do a different example. Love and slavery or freedom. Did you hear that? Love and slavery. Love to love is to be enslaved according to this definition. You can't love and be free according to how people think about life is right now, philosophers right now. When you're, when you're in love, you want to do things that please the object of your affection. Uh, you, you make decisions then not, not to op optimize your own freedom, but often uh, you make decisions that limit your own freedom. Uh, they don't like sports, so I don't watch sports. Hey, that's a limit to my freedom, right? Uh, they love Italian food, and I don't. So I still go to an Italian restaurant. A limit to my freedom. Uh, they hate traveling, so I stop traveling. A limit to my freedom. Or it gets worse, okay? They get cancer. I stop my life and live only to serve them. Now I'm not just limited, I'm enslaved by this other person. The love, love is by definition. In modern times, in the modern concept, love is a loss of freedom. Because if I love someone, I put my needs aside and put their needs first. In, some, in this country, there are some divorces that come because the other person is impeding their freedom and they say, don't I have a right to be happy? And there are divorces that come from that. To be free is never to love, by definition. Other people affect my freedom and the decisions I make. So I must not love in order to be free, according to the modern definition. Now let me reassure you, 
As you probably already know, this is not how God or Jesus defines freedom. That's not how they define it. Our whole society defines uh, uh, freedom as freedom to. This is what our society does. Freedom to choose. Freedom to vote. Freedom to this. Freedom to that. Freedom to be who I want. Jesus defines freedom as freedom from. Not freedom to, but freedom from. Um, uh, sh- let me go back to where we He's talking about freedom from sin here. Now, there's more to it than that, but it's mostly freedom from sin that Jesus is talking about here. And that is exactly how the people he spoke to heard it. They heard him as saying freedom from, not freedom to. Jesus and the teachers both understood that sin, sin is the great enslaver. Sin is the great enslaver. Sin limits everything we can do, everything we could be. It limits our experience of God's creation. It controls us. It debases us. How do I know that this is what they're talking about? Listen to the response. Jesus says, the truth will set you free, and they answer. Verse 33, and they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? It might not ring in our ears as, as as the same thing. When Jesus says, the truth will set you free, They respond by saying, we are Abraham's children. You hear it? Here's what they couldn't mean. Uh, They can't mean that Abraham's descendants were never enslaved because they were in slavery in Egypt. And in the Bible, there are passages that talk about people selling themselves into slavery in order to pay off debt. Now, Jesus condemns slavery in a different passage. We're not going to talk about that today. But Slavery exists in the Old Testament and existed for the people of Jesus' time. Uh, They're not talking about slavery to debt or having a master. They're talking about our relationship to God. That's why they bring up Abraham. It's the relationship to God. Jesus says the truth will set you free. They understood Jesus as talking about a relationship with God. And since the time of Abraham, they have not been enslaved by their sin. And we know that this is, Jesus agrees with all of this because hear hear his response. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin, do you hear it? You'll be free. The truth will set you free. We are Abraham's descendants. Anyone, everyone who commits sin, hear it? The connections. Anyone who commits sin is the slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does does remain forever so if the son makes you free you will be free indeed freedom for jesus is freedom from sin they say we are abraham's children he responds with everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin doesn't matter if you're abraham's children you commit sin you're a slave to sin what jesus is saying here is when you're free from sin you are free indeed the only freedom that makes any sense in this life is freedom from sin. You have no freedom at all if you're still enslaved with sin, even if you make choices that are not unimpeded. You're still enslaved. Not only that, if you are enslaved to sin, you will die. But freed from sin, you will live. Isn't that amazing? If I'm a slave to sin, I die. But if I'm freed from sin, I'll live. I'll live in the house of God for how long? Forever. The slave does not remain in the house forever. But the son or daughter does. And that's what Jesus is going to do for us. At this time, he's talking about, he's leading up to what I'm going to do for you. You are not going to be a slave in the house of God. You are going to be a son or daughter because of what I'm going to do for you. I want to show you something else before we get to the important word, truth. The teachers that Jesus is talking to are suggesting this. They're suggesting. They're not suggesting they're sinless. That's not what they're suggesting. Uh, They're not suggesting that all Jews are uh, are saved, but they're saying that in Abraham, a system was put into place so that people could be free from sin. Okay. So in Abraham, a system was put into place. 
It involves obeying the Ten Commandments. It involves a system where if you break one of the commandments or one of the other laws, you can make up for it by either offering a sacrifice or doing good deeds. Or both. The teachers of the law understood that Jesus was teaching people that the system given to them by Moses did not work. So that when Jesus begins to teach that the truth will set you free, they claim to have the truth already. Okay? That's what they're claiming. The teachers of Jesus' time claim their truth is from Abraham, which is why they say, we are Abraham's children. The truth that we have is from Abraham. And they're saying that the truth Jesus is about to give is not from Abraham. Their truth, in reality, at best, comes from Moses. It doesn't really. This is, they don't do what Moses actually taught. But you can make an argument for it. And they would be very good at making that argument for that. But it comes from Moses, not from Abraham. And let me, let me show you how I know this. Abraham, Abraham uh, did not know the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments hadn't been given. He couldn't know it. Now, I think you guys should all know the Ten Commandments. Uh, but Abraham didn't know the Ten Commandments. Abraham did not keep kosher. There were no kosher laws, so he did not keep kosher. He offered sacrifices to God, but he didn't offer them the way the priests instructed people to offer them, or at the times he was supposed to offer them. He didn't do that, because those times hadn't been mentioned yet. The, the ways hadn't been set yet. The Pharisees were suggesting that all of this comes from Abraham, but it doesn't. Abraham didn't do all the things that they're suggesting. The Pharisees taught that righteousness came from obeying the law, giving up proper sacrifices at the proper times. Do this and you will be saved. What Scripture teaches, well, let's say, what, what is it, how is it that Abraham was saved? Was it from obeying the laws? Was it from doing these things as these Pharisees taught? Let's turn to Genesis and see. Genesis 15, 6. Then he, Abraham, then Abraham believed in the Lord and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Abraham believes. He doesn't offer sacrifices. He believes. His righteousness is not based on sacrifices he made. His, he was declared righteous not because he obeys a set of rules or that God had given them. Uh, you know, this is how we... We reckon people as righteous in our society. Do they obey the law? Uh, do they do good deeds? Oh, they're such a good person. This is how we rate people in our society. This is not how God does it. Abraham was not declared righteous for any of those things. It was because he believed. He had faith. Faith in what? That God would do something to save him. He didn't know what God was going to do. In, in Genesis 15, he didn't know. He just knew God was going to do something. Here in Genesis 15, Jesus, Abraham believes that a Savior will come to save him and his house. A son will be born. Now, he thinks that son is going to be uh, Isaac. He knows it's not Ishmael, the son who's already been born to him. God's told him that salvation will not be coming through Ishmael. He believes it's going to be through some son that hasn't been born yet. He believes God is going to give him a son, even though he's like 90 years old and his wife is 88. I don't know how many 88-year-olds you know have given birth, but it does seem to be a stretch. When she hears the angel tell him that uh, she will have a son, she laughs. That's hilarious. Me at my age. Whoosh. That's a lack of faith. Abraham has faith. Hear how different it is from the teachers of Jesus' time. God declares salvation when Abraham believes. Not in works, not being born a Jew. Now, Pastor Paul, Pastor Paul, how can you make a whole theology based on one verse? Well, I don't actually do it on one verse, just so you know, okay? So in Genesis 12, Abraham has faith. He leaves his land and goes to a place where God has guided him. In Genesis 22, when Abraham puts his son on the altar, God stops his hand and blesses him 
because he has withheld nothing from God in faith. Because he believed that God would bring his son back to life. That faith saves Abraham. Not his works, not the things he does, not the kind of person he was. Jesus says he who commits sin is a slave to sin. Well, that's all of us, isn't it? That's all of us, including Abraham. Abraham isn't saved by what he does. He's saved by who he believes in. What is salvation? According to Jesus, the the end, end result of salvation is a place in the house of God. You will be in my house. You will be a son and daughter. We will be one of God's children. A slave has no place in the household. They have, a slave has no place. But a son and daughter, they belong. They belong in the house. A child of God has every right to be there. In Genesis 12, 15, and 22, Abraham does not know what God is going to do except provide the sacrifice. Abraham knows the animal he offers to God in in Genesis 22 is not enough to save him from his sins. He believes God is going to do something more, something better, something through Isaac, the son who is there. God's going to do something through one of his descendants. God knows he's going to provide that sacrifice. Now, some people believe that the place where Abraham puts Isaac on the altar to sacrifice him. That is the place where Jesus was crucified. Some people believe it's the same place. The truth will set you free. Now we move from Abraham back to Jesus. The truth is not that if you live the right way and offer the right sacrifices and are related to the right people, uh, you will come to heaven. Uh, there are lots of things wrong, wrong with this. I'll highlight two, okay? One, it, it, first one is it doesn't work. You, you can't do it. You can't live this way. No one can live this way. Uh, Jesus exposes the hypocrisy of, uh, I mean, he, he wants to encourage us to try to be nice to one another, right? But it's just not possible to live that way in, in the right way so that you can reach heaven. You can't do it. Uh, we remember that Cain's offering was not accepted, but Abel's was. Well, the difference between the two offerings is meaningless. It's, it's irrelevant. God wasn't looking at the offerings. He doesn't need the offerings. He doesn't care about the offerings. He's looking at the person's heart. God saw into Abel's heart and saw that he was sorry for what the sins that he had committed. He looked into Cain's heart and he saw, you know, you know the next thing on Cain's to-do list was killing Abel. Good heavens, I'm not accepting your sacrifice if you're planning on killing your brother. It doesn't matter what you put there. Don't kill your brother. Repent of that first. Two. God doesn't want to save the self-righteous. Now, before we get a little weird, I I want to explain what I mean by this, okay? Uh, This system under that the the Pharisees mistakenly said was under Moses. The system that they had they had put together with sacrifices and good deeds and a living right and obeying the Ten Commandments. This whole system uh, was meant as a system for people to save themselves. That is, to make themselves righteous. That is a system of self-righteousness. Do you hear it? God doesn't save people like that. You can't save yourself. What does God want to do? We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, right? What does God want to do? God wants to save everyone. everyone. God wants to save everyone. Just turn to your neighbor and remind him. We talked about it a couple of weeks, but obviously we need some reminder. God wants to save everyone. Everyone. Including those people who are trying to justify themselves, the self-righteous. Now, For sake of argument, let's say, for sake of argument, let's say some people could do that, right? You you really can't. Everyone is condemned under the system, but let's say you could. But for sake of argument, argument's sake, let's say some people, you know, people could. Uh, We find if there's some people who try to follow the system, 
won't be able to, out of a, a lack of character or a lack of intelligence or wisdom, a lack of something. There's some people that will fall short because they will not be able to do it at all for whatever reason we could put through. And some people may not be able to do it because they're too poor. You can't offer the right sacrifices if you can't get the right sacrifices. Some people, I mean, you know, all sorts of reasons that they might fall short that don't seem right. They don't resonate, right? Why should the poor be excluded from salvation? That doesn't some don't sound like something a loving God would do, does it? Jesus comes to earth to bring us truth with a capital T. Truth will set you free. His truth. What is his truth? Jesus' truth is you can be saved the same way Abraham was saved. Not by what you do, not by what you offer, not by keeping a set of things, not by being a good person, but only by having a relationship with God, with the Son of God, accepting God's accepting God. The same system that saved Isaac and Jacob, the same system that saved Joseph and Moses and Daniel uh, is the same one that Jesus offers us. It's not about rule keeping. It's not about balancing the sheets of justice. Well, I mean, it is, but it's not about how we can do it. We can't balance that sheet. We don't have that power. It's not about making up for shortcomings, of which we all have many. We're to be truthful to ourselves, right? Um, in public, I don't admit any shortcomings, but when I look in the mirror, I can certainly see them. Ooh. It's, not, it, it's all about a son who has come to die for our sins. A son was promised to Abraham. That's, that's, what, that's what God promises him, a son. A son will be born to you. It's the same promise for us. A son will be born for, to us, who will save us. A, a son... One who would come and make Abraham the father of many nations. One who would be the sacrifice Isaac could never be. And that when you believe on him, have faith in him, you are not free just from your sin. You're transplanted into a new family. If, if, if I have a system in place where I do certain things and then I end up in heaven, you know, that actually means that I'm my own God. Did you know that? That really means that I've, I've made myself righteous. I'm righteous in this world. I am my own God. And we attach that to our idea of what freedom is in this world. We have a really dangerous thing going on, right? I, I'm now my own God in charge of my own world, and I encounter someone else who is their own God in charge of my world. Now you have conflict that cannot be resolved because the, if, if their freedom impedes my freedom, then we're at war. And there is no freedom. There is no peace. I can have freedom, but not if they're there. I have to get rid of them to have my freedom. The teachers of Jesus' time want us to believe in this illusion that by following the rules, I can get to heaven. And Jesus is challenging them with reality. And they will not have it. They attack him. Jesus later in the passage, in the same, in chapter 8, in, in verse 51, Jesus says this. Oh, do I have another one there? There we are. One who would sat, be the sacrifice Isaac could never be. Oh, and there's a whole other page, right? And that you, when you believe on him, you will live. Thank you, Paul, or uh, Ben, whoever's on the board up there. Ben, all right. Good for Ben. Where am I now? Do we have uh, John 8, 51 up there? Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Sounds like Jesus is just providing another set of rules, doesn't it? Keeps my word. Keeps my word. If there are any rules for Jesus, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tweak this a little bit in a second, but if there are any rules, the rules for Jesus are this. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor, let's hear it, as yourself. If there are any rules, that's the two rules. That's it. Love God with all you are, everything you are, and love your neighbor as yourself. If there are rules, those are the only two rules. And we don't do these rules 
in order to get to heaven, we do these rules in gratefulness for something God has already done in saving us. I don't pay my way to get to heaven by doing this stuff. I do this stuff because somebody else has paid my way. In the book of John, you see, John, when, when John uses this term word, anyone who keeps my word, uh, when he uses the term word, often he's not talking about the Bible. Hey, the Bible as we know it is, hasn't been written yet. They just have the Old Testament. New Testament hasn't been written. I mean, and the word is good. I love the Bible, right? The, the Bible is there with stories that fill me and, and, way, and teaches me the way I should walk in order to get along with one another and, and to be a better person because I want to be a better person. And then, you know, predictions about the future which blow my mind sometimes, right? So he has all of this stuff that's in there it's just wonderful for teaching and for learning and for learning about God. But when John talks about the word, he's not talking about words on a page. He's talking about the word who has walked among us, Jesus himself. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word. Do you keep Jesus? Do you keep him here? Is he living in your heart? That's all it takes. Abraham, without ever having seen Jesus, believed that God was going to do something. A son would be born to him. He kept Jesus in here without knowing his name. We know his name. And as Jesus speaks to these Pharisees, they have no idea what Jesus is going to be doing in just a few months after, after this conversation they have in John 8 that he would be going to the cross to die for them. Because there's no way they can get to heaven. There's nothing they can do to do it. Jesus has to do it all in order for us to get there. Do you keep the word in your heart? Now, I don't have a blank for that on your sheet, but you could write that on there. Do I keep the word in my heart? Just to remind yourself later, if you look at this piece of paper, to think about that. This is the time. This is the time we come to this table and celebrate what Jesus has done, to rededicate our lives, to refocus our perspective back towards Jesus and know that he lives in our heart. But that we don't get to heaven because of a set of oppressive rules. Uh, by, we get to heaven because of Jesus and God's love for us. When I am my own God, and you are your own God, there is nothing but war. But if Jesus is my God, and Jesus is your God, then we have nothing but peace. It's only by setting ourselves aside and embracing the freedom Jesus offers us, the freedom from sin, that peace can actually happen in this world. And whenever we exercise freedom... As, as modern people understand it, all we get, well, all you got to do is turn on the television. There are examples of people ex exercising their freedom every day. And it's not pretty. It's not wonderful. It's not what the founding fathers and mothers of our country envisioned for us. Because all of them, most of them, had Jesus in their hearts. They knew life is about choices. And they wanted freedom from tyranny. Just as Jesus wants us to have that. May I have our servers come forward, our deacons come forward. As we gather around this table, let us remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us abraham was promised a son and it wasn't isaac it was jesus a son who would be a sacrifice for our sin a, a, a perfect sacrifice a sacrifice we cannot find anywhere in this existence at all because everything's been tainted by sin there is no perfect sacrifice no lamb that's perfect no cow no bull no nothing you can offer no person that's perfect you can put on this altar that would make up for the sins that we have individually committed but jesus was perfect 
And because Jesus was God, he could die on the cross and every person's sins throughout all of history, from all in the past and all the way into the future to the end of time, could be forgiven because of his perfection. Because he wasn't just a man, he was God. And because he was God, he loved us. A love we don't deserve. But believing in him, we get a place in heaven. We get a peace of infinity. Who was my math major? When I cut infinity in half, what do I have? I have two infinities. We come to this table to remember, to reflect. And how we prepare for ourselves. And I want to make sure that everybody knows. Anybody who believes in Jesus is welcome at this table. You do not need to be a member of this church. You don't need to be a Baptist. Anybody is welcome at this table. But as we come to this table, we ask people to prepare their hearts. So let us bow our heads and confess our sins to the Lord our God. Lord, whatever sins I have committed since the last time I came to this table, Lord, help me. I, I, I may not remember even half of them. But Lord, I come and I put them on this table. And I know that even those sins I don't remember, those sins I don't confess, you have forgiven and I come to this table and I am blessed by you because you have prepared a place for me. I am blessed by you because you have died for me. I am blessed by you because you have called me brother and you have called us brothers and sisters and you have made us family in the house of God. So I am not a slave there. I am one of your sons and daughters and I am grateful. Lord, I confess these sins and I ask you to forgive me. And I thank you, Lord, for that forgiveness. And I am grateful, Lord, for all you have done. And help me show my gratefulness by taking the joy that you have implanted in my heart and sharing it with everyone I know. And as we share this bread and this juice here today, remind me of the sacrifice you have made. Remind me of all the things you have done in my life. Remind me of the miracles that you have, you have done to bring me even to this place, even to hearing these words. Pray, Lord, that you continue to work strongly through me and in me. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name, and everyone said,
On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, said, eat of this, my body, broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup and he blessed it. He said, this is my blood shed for you. Drink this in remembrance of me. It is the tradition of our church to end a communion service by a gathering in a circle and parading past this basket. This basket is our uh, benevolence fund, which we use to help people in the community, such as someone who comes with, that needs gasoline, who, who doesn't have much, much money, we can sometimes buy them gasoline, or a person who's sleeping out in the streets uh, needs a night in a hotel, we sometimes pay for that. And, and utilities and other emergencies that come up for our members. And so we ask people to pray for, prayfully consider giving towards helping those in our church and those in our community with extraordinary need. And so we ask you to just walk by the basket. No judgment if you don't put anything in there. You can give later or not at all. It's a, it's a blessing just to be able to help people. And we ask you then to make a circle so that we might close our service in song. in our circle so just grab a hand it doesn't need to be a perfect circle circle the only thing that's perfect is that jesus in heaven so yeah but corralling kids that's also fun are you going to join us in our circle all right all right let us share the lord's prayer our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Now may the Lord bless and guide you and give you an opportunity to share the Holy Savior with someone who desperately needs 
the truth, and the life. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.